You're listening to the Dune Sh- Steve. Um, yeah. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Smiles, everyone, smiles. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 1, page 12. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. That's 08 OT. And I am announcer man. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, announcer man, we don't have time for you today. What is this? It's okay, just take your smoke break a little early. Uh-huh. <laughs> Today's story is Miranda and the Butterfly by Abby Hilton. Abby lives in Portland, Oregon. She has a convoluted academic background that includes a degree in biology, mm. a semester in veterinary school, mm. half a literature master's, mm. and a degree in nursing. Mm. She's about to graduate with a master's in anesthesia. I, you know, I really liked that. That was the one with uh, Meg Ryan and, uh, and uh, who was the other guy? John Cusack? Not John Cusack? Fox Animation Studio. They, they don't I... exist now. Oh, anesthesia. Uh... R.O.D.T., can you edit that part out, please? After which she plans to not go to school for a while. Her work has appeared previously on the Dune Steve as well as on the Drabblecast, and she has stories in The Greatest Uncommon Denominator and Beyond Centauri. Abby's podcast novel, The Prophet of Panamandora, has kept her sane throughout her senior year of anesthesia school, and the feed continues to update with news, contests, short stories, and rambling dialogues with her brother. Her next project, an illustrated novel in full cast audio, will begin on December 12th at cowrecatchers.com. If you listen, you might hear some voices you recognize. Miranda and the Butterfly by Abigail Hilton When Miranda was seven, she asked her mother whether she had a daddy. Yes, he was a traveling salesman. Her mother sounded so disgusted that Miranda didn't ask again until she was ten. This time, her mother said, He was a lousy, no good, lying fairy. Miranda took this to mean that her father was gay, an idea she accepted philosophically. Miranda had a friend, Jeremy, who was gay. As far as Miranda could tell, this meant that Jeremy would admit to liking My Little Ponies, and was more fun to play with than other boys. He also got beaten up a lot. When Miranda was 12, Jeremy decided to become tough in order to keep from getting beaten up. As far as Miranda could tell, being tough meant being a jerk. Miranda missed him. Miranda sometimes wondered what her father looked like. Her mother had silky black hair, green eyes and skin that tanned cinnamon in summer. Miranda had one green eye and one pale blue eye, which was cool but not very pretty. She had white blonde hair and skin so fair that other kids teased her and called her an albino. She never tanned. Miranda also had one ear that folded against her head. She didn't mind, although she sometimes wished her ears matched. On the day Miranda turned 13, she got the flu. Her mother had to go to work, so Miranda sat alone at home, reading and trying to pretend that being home alone was better than being at school. She was slurping her eighth watermelon popsicle when the doorbell rang. Miranda went to the door, but found no one. She turned back into the house and came face to face with a man. If she hadn't known better, she would have said he stepped out of the hall mirror. Miranda would have been frightened if she hadn't been angry. If you don't get out of here right now, I'll call the police. See, I have a cell phone. The man looked embarrassed. He had blonde hair to his waist and blue eyes. Out. To her surprise, the man dropped to one knee. I plead your pardon, gentle dame, but I am seeking the Lady Miranda. I'm Miranda. You're weird. Get off my floor. He looked up eyes searching her face. Miranda realized that he had two ears exactly like her folded one. Are you a traveling salesman? She ventured. I am your father, the Lord Beamfrost. Miranda raised one eyebrow. It was a trick she was proud of. Jeremy had been trying to do it for years. Beamfrost? 
Yes, but you may call me... How about I call you Dad? He looked relieved. Yes. Dad, you could stand up. Let's um, talk outside. Lord Beamfrost trailed her into the backyard. He began absently plucking jasmine blossoms and popping them into his mouth. He broke off an Easter lily and ate that too. Miranda stared at him. Stop that! He licked pollen from his fingers. You don't act much like a lady. And you don't act much like a dad. She thought she could see the suggestion of wings in the air behind him. How did you meet my mother? I stole her away to my castle in Fairy. I fell in love with her, poor human creature, and she convinced me to return her to her world. Alas, a hundred years had passed. I'm afraid we parted on poor terms. Miranda had always wondered why there were no photographs of her grandparents. I suppose she missed her family and friends. I suppose she did. Are you going to steal me, too? I heard fairies steal kids. Lord Beamfrost shook his head. I only wish to see you. I meant to come on your first birthday. You're twelve years late. Time is strange between Earth and fairy. Truth to tell, I am somewhat forgetful. He looked at her, pleadingly. It is the nature of my race. Miranda considered. So, why are you here now? You want me to go on a quest? You have some terrible problem that only a 13-year-old girl can solve? She hesitated. You need money? Lord Beamfrost looked bewildered. I only wanted to meet you. Really? Really. He left two hours later. Miranda wanted to take a picture, but he wouldn't show up in the screen of her digital camera. People will think I dreamed him. But she didn't care. She was having too much fun listening to stories of dryads, unicorns, enchanted streams, and mermaids. I want to give you a gift before I leave, he said. I could turn all the butterflies in your garden into tiny pegasi, or I could turn the water in your house into chocolate. I could make anyone love you, or I could make others believe whatever you said. I cannot change things permanently, though. The magic will begin to fade the instant I leave your world. Miranda thought hard. You can't make my eyes the same color or my ears match? Not forever. Could you make someone remember something? I could, but I could not make anyone act on a memory. You mean that whether the person did anything about it would be his choice? Yes. Miranda nodded. All right. And maybe, maybe one butterfly pegasus. Moments later, Miranda hugged him goodbye, and the fairy walked away into the mirror. In the kitchen, beneath an upturned drinking glass, a tiny blue and gold pegasus fluttered and preened. A little while later, the doorbell rang. Miranda found Jeremy on the front step. He didn't quite meet her eyes. I heard you were sick, and, um, I remembered it was your birthday. Miranda raised one eyebrow. Jeremy handed her a wrapped box. Inside, she found a My Little Pony. Miranda hadn't played with ponies in more than a year, but she knew it wasn't really a toy. It was a peace offering. Toy horses aren't very tough, she said. Tough's kind of boring. Miranda grinned. Come inside, Jeremy. There's something I want to show you. Author's note. I wrote this story two Christmases ago after listening to Susanna Clark's uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. You have to be the right kind of person in the right kind of mood to enjoy Strange and Norrell, but I was and I did. It's an odd rambling book and it's packed full of little fairy tales that have only the most marginal relationship to the story. Clark drops them into the footnotes and a little asides in the narrative, and she makes writing fairy tales look so easy. She just tosses them off carelessly, uh, these clever little stories that are probably publishable in their own right. Some of them were the seeds of good novels. She just seems to have an endless supply. After reading Strange and Norrell, I wanted to write a fairy tale, and Miranda turned up. The story started life at the uncomfortable length of 1,200 words. Nobody knows what to do with 1,200-word stories. They don't quite fit as either full-length or flash. And I finally managed to prune it down to 1,000 words on the nose, 
I submitted it to the Dune Steve as a joke after they said they didn't want Flash. Um, I was surprised they took it. And then they wanted to know if it would be okay if they made fun of me a lot in the outro. <laughs> and I was like, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, and now I'm all nervous. Uh, you, you can't really say no to that sort of thing, because if you do, then you're a thin-skinned girl. Um, but they've actually managed to transform my excitement to dread. Um, apparently I made a stupid spelling error. So, um, it's just a little fairy tale, guys. Uh, if you weren't entertained, you still got your money's worth. Hey, welcome back. Good, good. So, Big, you want to tell how we got this story? Somebody sent it in, well, and we read it, and we decided to run it. Wow. See, I'm on the seat of my edge right now. Uh, so let me just uh, get this out of the way. Of all the stories we've done on the show, this is the one with the most suggestive closing line. Feel free to rewind, <laughs> just double check. I think I had to say that because you would have said it had I not. Yeah, I think I said something naughty when we read the story right afterward. But we're not going to play that for anyone. Oh, wait. Explicit is a selling point, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. That's what she was talking about. Come in. There's something I want to show you. It's in my pants. So would you say that, that we have a new record with this story? I would think so, yeah. And what record is that? Well, but besides most suggestive last line. <laughs> well, it's uh, definitely the shortest turnaround time on a story. I read this story a very short period ago, and I said, wow, this one's a good one. It's short, and we need one that's short because we got uh, some vacation time coming up here. And we're going to need something ready to go while we're out. We haven't even sent Abby the contract yet, or even an acceptance letter, I think, on, upon reading this. Let's not send it. Let's just have this be a surprise that she can get really mad about. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, definitely a quick turnaround. Um, normally, we're more known for our very, 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 very long wait that we force authors to endure. Like last week's Edge of the Map. Ah, when yes. would you say we got that story? November at the latest. Eh. Earlier. Go earlier, please. <laughs> September? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> that is correct. Wow. You have control of the board. Go ahead and pick your category. I'm wondering about the penis mightier, Alex. Oh, uh, Mr. Connery, that's the pen is mightier. Oh, well, you can call it what you want. What I want to know is, does it work? Did, did we just buy it because it's short? No, of course not. I like the story. Um, mostly because it was similar to your story. You son of a... <laughs> Warning. Today's episode contained comments from Rish Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. No, uh, yeah, I like the story. I think I thought it was really cool. Um, and apparently Abby doesn't write stories that are long. She writes short stories and... 250,000 word stories, but nothing in between. By the way, Abby, yes, I have listened to your book. How about that? And I quite enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to cowie catchers. Cow pie catchers. I hear there's some good talent going to be involved in that story, too. I, I don't know if that's the case, but... Well, if Norm Sherman doesn't do a voice on it, then you can stuff it up your... Uh, he is. Oh, okay. Well, then, never mind. Good on you, Abby. <laughs> Thanks for ripping off my story, by the way. Well, tell us about that, Mr. Rish Outfield. What are you talking about? I'm confused. Well, let me enlighten you, son. Warning, today's comments from Rish Outfield are especially stupid. Listener discretion is advised. That's actually growing somewhat tiresome. Not to me. <laughs> uh, there's no story behind it. When I walked out of Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe, I was like, wow, that's kind of a cool movie. Sort of a nefarious message behind that thing. You know, it's like slapping you across the face with a herring. And I thought, I wonder if I could write an evil version of that. I wonder if I could write something with the complete opposite message. So I wrote this story, and then I didn't even really write it. I just finished it like last year or something like that. And then I looked it up today, and I hadn't actually finished it. So somehow, Abby had stolen my idea, made it shorter, made it more coherent. I think she added actual character to the story. Different ending, different cast of characters, different beginning. Different sort of the body, the main part of the story. Um, different... But 
action, different motivation of the characters, different dialogue. All right. But, but besides that, it was exactly fudging like your exactly, story. Exactly. Especially the fudging part. And, and Abby, I'm just, I'm infuriated. Is that a word? I think so. It's like, I'm furious, but yeah. I'm infuriated <laughs> by your story. <laughs> <laughs> for just ruining my chances of ever publishing my story about a little boy who is raised by ghosts. Um, no, no, no. Uh, uh, plagiarism aside, although I could tell the plagiarism story that I always wanted to. Okay, what is it? Uh, uh, now it's Tell Me a Story, Mommy, with Rish Outfield. Damn it, announcer man. Okay, I will not tell that story. Abby is a, a friend of the show. Did we mention that? Today... We probably should have mentioned that because I, I feel like that because she's an associate of the show, she's a, what would you say? What, she's an unofficial Dune Stephian. Okay, I guess I would take that. If Dune Stephian was a word I'd like to kick around in mixed company. Are you insinuating something with that mixed company comment? Oh, no. <laughs> yes. She does voices for us all the time. I don't know that it would be appropriate to ask her to do a voice on her own story. But I'll tell you what, we'll ask her or ask her. Or arcs her to do a voice next week to make up for this one. And in fact, maybe we'll even do an episode where we praise her instead of belittle her. We could try that. But uh, yeah, she helps us all the time. So I hope that she can take this kind of abuse. Let's, let's just tear apart her story. Paragraph one. Actually, it was really well written. There was one part where the character's name was Murata. Yeah. So but take that. I like the name Murata. That's kind of cool. It's like... Here come the marauders! Everyone get to your shelters! Let's see, was there any other faults in her story that we should pick at? Too short, Abby. <laughs> the hell? You know, I've always wondered when people spell fairy, F-A-E-R-I-E, -E, uh -huh. instead of F-A-I-R-Y, which she spelled both ways in the story. Oh, um, yeah, there's another fault. Damn pick it! At it. Pick, pick, Abby? Pick. Oh, well, it's that Joss Whedon song. We're gonna pick, 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 pick. Pick it apart, open it up, and hear the tick, tick, tick of its heart. Warning, today's episode contains singing. No, oh, it doesn't. That, that, you were a little slow on that one, announcer man. You know, if you would cut down on the cigarette intake, I think you could actually make it into the room in time for your one duty. Oh, I said duty on the air. Ooh. This is explicit. Do you think that we encourage children to smoke by mentioning announcer man's habit? We've mentioned that it smells bad, right? I hope, yeah. Sometimes when he urinates, it comes out black. Yes. I don't know if we can mention that. <laughs> it's the tar, boys and girls. So sometimes people spell fairy, F-A-E-R-I-E. -E, and I've always wondered, is that pronounced fairy or is that pronounced in a different way? Like fairy? I have to admit, I think I said once. I don't know if you're going to use that. And what is the difference between fairy and fairy? Is it one is old English and one is just modern? You know how Tolkien said the plural of dwarf was dwarves, and up until then it was dwarfs? I did not know that. Well, maybe not. What are the guys that work at Santa's workshop called? Elves. God damn it. So Tolkien invented golems, right? They don't exist in, like, Jewish mythology or anything. Oh, another thing, you know, I had the darndest time trying to figure out how to do the father's voice, the, the fairy's voice. I don't know why that would be a problem for you. You talk like a fairy every day, all the time. Wait, I'm sorry, what? I, I was texting. What did you say? <laughs> oh, no, nothing. No, I was uh, moving on. Okay. Um. Yeah, you said it, O8OT. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, whoa. What did he say? He said he thought you sounded just like a fairy. Well, thank you, man. I, did you do some kind of fixing? Did you alter his programming somehow? Oh, he sounds, yeah, yeah. I he put sounds... a screwdriver in there and tightened up a... Yeah. <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, thank you, R.O.A.T. I think we've embarked on a new year where we get along. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Anything more you want to say about the story? I don't know. You know, I think it's kind of a universal idea or, or, or fantasy or dream, you know. Yes. A, a, Please say more words. Uh, like a notion, a uh, thought, a uh, fancy. Keep going. Keep going. Come on. Go ahead. Come um, on. You can do a it. Con con conception. A, a universal hankering, if you will. <laughs> oh. I think you've run out, man. <laughs> that you're not just an ordinary mundane person. That someone will come along one day and say, no, you have a greater destiny. Or no, you are meant for awesome things, for amazing things. You're not just little Big Anklevich from Portside, Indiana. You are the son of a 
duke or a bitch or a magician or a king or a, a famous space captain like that exactly that's kind that kind of stuff yeah and it, it comes up time and time and time again in literature the whole idea of somebody who thinks they're ordinary finding out that they're extraordinary you're a wizard harry well that's probably the best example in in our modern times and i'm sure that we could kick back and forth hundreds of Luke Skywalker's or... Yeah, every uh, kid's book these days has that in it. I'm reading a book to my kids right now called Percy Jackson and the Olympians. I saw the trailer for that at the beginning of Harry Potter. Oh, really? They're doing a film of it, huh? Yeah, Chris Columbus is directing it. Oh. And it's uh, the first in an epic trilogy. Sectologically. Yeah, we're reading the first one, and I don't think it's as good as Harry Potter is, but it's the same thing. This kid is a kid, and oh, it turns out, no, he's part Greek god. Basically, every kid's story is that way. Matilda, Luke Skywalker, like you said, or... That's another good one like that. Oh, gee, Aragon. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a common, very common theme. And uh, this story, of course, taps into that. And that's basically, Abby, what I was saying. Uh, my story is that same thing. You know, a little girl finds out that she's not ordinary. Except for that it was a boy. Yeah. And the characters were one-dimensional mm -hmm. and run-on sentences everywhere. And yeah. uh, a lack of punctuation pretty much throughout. There were some commas. Yeah, and no capitalization or... Uh... Yeah, I capitalized most of the names. Anyways. The point I was trying to make is that it's a universal idea. And it's something that resonates within us. Or at least within me. I don't really give a crap about the other people that are listening. Obviously from the last few minutes of our podcast. But yeah, the, boy, there were so many times that, it's, that wouldn't it be great to find out that you were meant to be somebody or meant to do something or, or that you were a fairy i think we've known that for quite some time actually but just simple average sarah connor the waitress down the block is the mother of the future savior of humanity and, and was there ever a moment with john connor where his mother explained to him or someone explained to him who he was and the destiny that he had before him and that the whole human race is going to depend on you. At the start of Terminator 2, it's like he'd been told that his whole life from the moment he was born, basically, by his mother. And so he was all effed up inside because his mother had been training him to be a freaking freedom fighter. So I'm pretty sure yes. So we never saw that moment. It was probably when he was one or, you know, it was like the first thing he knew. You could say, Mama, Dada, Savior of the World. <laughs> well, how about Neo from The Matrix? Now I'm a, not a big fan, but it, it's, does Lawrence Fishburne tell him he's the one? Or does he overhear that he's the one? Or do they just say that you have the ability to be special? I don't know. <laughs> What's another example, then? Uh, do we need more? Probably not. Arthur, king of the Britons. Now, was he not the son of, of Uther Pendragon? I don't know, but he had to pull the sword out, or he had to find it in the lake, or whatever, before yeah, it became Yeah, that's something I don't get. It's, which did he do? Did he pull it out of the stone, or did the lady in the lake plaid in the most shimmering semite aloft excalibur from the bosom of the water? Anyhow, I guess what I'm saying is I, I, I've had fantasies where big jugged chicks come to my window. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Aroito T, after I said such nice things about you, would you be so kind as to edit that little part out? He says, certainly, Rish. Okay. So I've had fantasies where somebody comes to me and they're from the future. Or, or I come from the future, an older version of me. And he's like, this is very important. You have to listen to me. And the, the fate of the future, the fate of the world, the fate of Hackensack, New Jersey, lies in your hands. You know, suddenly I am important. Suddenly I make a difference. Suddenly people depend on me. Is that universal? You feel that way? You ever fantasize about that sh yeah, stuff? Yeah, well? I, I think I did a lot of that too. It probably may have something to do with the fact that we both like to write stories. No, I don't know, but I had a. I always wanted to be. Oh, there's another one. A uh, lumberjack. The last starfighter. Aliens were going to come down and get me, and I was going to go up into space and be the greatest space guy. Well, just in Abrams Star Trek, doesn't Pike tell Kirk that he has a destiny that he ha he can be more than he is? Oh, but, okay, but Spock tells him, old Spock tells him that you are supposed to be captain of the Enterprise and that you and I are, are friends in the future and that we, I, I'm sure he says make a difference or something. Uh -huh. I, I don't know. I just, to me, that resonates. That really affects me and just the, the thought of being unique in, you know, in a good way and not just strange or not just the slowest one on the track or 
<laughs> the one who strikes out the most often. Although probably not even that, because you have no. to play the game to. You have to get off the bench to miss the goal. All right, OT, you know what to do. All right, so what you're saying is that story resonated a little with you. All of those stories resonate a little with me. I hoped that it would with everyone. And, you know, you've got to wonder if Prince Harry, uh, the son of Charles, Prince Charles and Diana, if he fantasizes about just being a farm boy or uh, just some guy in, in he, Leeds. He probably fantasizes of being William. <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, we could go on and on about different examples, and we could go on and on about Anakin Skywalker, and maybe that that would have been really interesting to have somebody say... Now, does he, in that first movie when he's the little kid, hear that he has a, just a buttload of midichlorians and he's got a higher reading than Yoda? I don't know. I don't think so, does he? Because he's like, I heard the word midichlorians. I was wondering, what are midichlorians? And Lucas is over in the corner counting his money. And the first AD says, George, did you hear the way you read that line? And George is like, yeah, yeah, print. I was thinking of teenage Anakin and all that. Did he know that he was supposed to... You were the chosen one! He was supposed to bring... What was Balance it? to the force, not plunge it into darkness! God, budge, that's a bad line. Yeah, purely by accident I started talking about Anakin, but you think we should just go ahead and do that right now? Sure. You know, you and I had wanted to... Okay, I had really wanted to do an episode where we talked about Phantom Menace, where we talked about Episode One, the Star Wars prequel, because it's been 10 years. Yeah, we wanted to try and get something together for May the 4th Be With You <laughs> with you Paul look. Lind as Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> the Force has a great... <laughs> How did that go? I'm the weak-minded. <laughs> a Force is what gives a Jedi his power, don't you know? On, uh, what is the uh, StarWars.com, They've been interviewing like a bunch of celebrity Star Wars fans about where were you 10 years ago and what was your experience of seeing Phantom Menace for the first time? And oddly enough, there are no... I stood in line and I was greatly disappointed. Oddly enough, they didn't put that on StarWars.com, huh? It's strange. Yeah, they left out the quote from Steve Martin where he said, I went home and I took a bath with a hairdryer. <laughs> All right, maybe only I found that funny. But I can't hear, but everybody out in the studio audience is laughing. No, oh, thank loud. you, sir. I did really want to talk about Phantom Menace because, as far as I know, that was the most anticipated film of all time. Now, it's been a whole decade. We had these Lord of the Rings films, which were big deals. We had a Matrix sequel. We had an Indiana Jones 4. We had a piece of shit Transformers. We had a lot of films with a lot of build up to them, a lot of anticipation, a lot of hype. But I don't think any of them were the 16 years in the making sequel, so to speak, to the, the biggest hits of all time. Yeah, I'd have to agree that that's probably the uh, most anticipated film of all time. I have alluded to the fact that I'm a big Star Wars fan on the show, and, and I have wanted to talk about Star Wars again and again. Frankly, we could do a whole month's <laughs> worth of episodes, oh. and each week is a different topic within Star Wars. A whole month worth of episodes, so like two episodes? <laughs> <laughs> that is not my fault. But I guess we can't do that unless somebody out there cares and said, well, I'd listen to that. Because I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do a top 10 best moments in all six Star Wars films, you know, of, of the saga? And then if we want, I, I, there are a couple of moments. It's just ugh. top 10 worst. It, 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 it just seems like there there are some cool conversations that we can have. I, I, top 10 pet peeves about Star Wars. And you mentioned one of them. I hate it when people call it episode four. A New Hope. I know that that's the subtitle, but it is called Star Wars, and it people wasn't know who is to that way. People know what you're talking about when you say Star Wars. Yeah, you don't have to clarify. It wasn't released as Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. That was the crap that George Lucas just threw on there because he was making modern serials, and so he wanted to just jump into the middle and say like, "This is Episode Four, as though we'd already had a bunch of other episodes before, and we're just right in the middle and. And so when he made the next one, it was episode five and episode six. But I, oh, I hate it when somebody says Carrie Fisher's performance in episode six was really bad. I, I have to do the friggin' math. I'm a yeah. giant Star Wars fan, and yet I have to do the math every time yeah. somebody does that. It's like they're deliberate. It's like when somebody says, yes, and uh, there is no actual evidence that a quantum singularity exists. And you're like, oh, I'm, 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 
Oh, a black hole? Okay. Th thank you, sir. You're deliberately being obtuse. <laughs> yeah, it just drives me crazy. Just call them what their name was. Everybody called it Phantom Menace. Everybody called it Attack of the Clones. They called it Revenge of the Sith. Empire Strikes Back. Star Wars. Return of the Jedi. That's their names. Don't say anything else or I will punch you. Well, for a long time, people were calling it Episode One. And if you remember, Lucas didn't reveal the title until like a ton of toys and promotional stuff was already being made. So there was lots of stuff that just said Star Wars Episode One on it. Yeah, that's cool. I, mean, I think episode one, I'm the most okay with, with people saying episode one. Uh-huh. Because... Because it went that way for a while. Uh, but, but anyhow, I, I suppose that's what we're talking about in this episode. Episode one? It's, it's Phantom Menace, yes. It's been ten years, and were you and I friends when all the the hype and all the the build up toward the release we were weren't we, we were yeah i don't you remember we had our open film fest in college and we showed that trailer that we ripped off the internet or well, something somebody like that? had recorded it off oh, entertainment well, that's, that's tonight right. on a vhs tape and then we projected it onto a theater screen yeah and that was the first time that i saw the trailer and everybody just freaked out and woo they were all excited and stuff and then we went on to show our crappy student films and nobody got excited about those for some reason but yeah we were friends even back then and so i think we were just getting to know each other back then and so yeah it was interesting you know i became your friend long before that when the special editions were putting out toys right. and stuff because you was it you or me <laughs> yeah was one of us had the do back the the lizard I, from star I, wars i went and bought mine with you at the fred meyer oh okay so we yeah that that was cool did you still have that do back i do don't have mine oh, yeah. like everything else it was stolen when i went uh, to LA. good old la it's such a wonderful place oh, can't wait to be back there oh. okay so so yeah we we saw that trailer and people would go to see movies they would go to see wing commander and stuff paid money to see those just to see the trailer yeah for the and wing Stars. commander was bad I, I remember lots of people just thinking oh man i went because i wanted to see the star wars trailer and i had to sit through wing commander and oh boy wing commander was crap dude <laughs> well out of freddie prince jr as the lead character i liked freddie prince jr uh, I, I mean, uh, yes, you're right. Terrible. You just, loved She's All That, didn't you? You know, I never actually saw that one, but that's the one with Jessica Biel in the red bikini, right? Oh, She's so. All That is the Rachel Lee Cook as the ugly girl because she wears glasses. Right. Movie. That's the standard. Glasses and sometimes braces. It's like Ugly Betty. She puts some glasses and, and bad sweaters on her. And say, hey, she's ugly. And then you see her out and you're like, what the heck? That's the chick that's Ugly Betty? If you like Ugly Betty, then you'll love Fugly Benji. <laughs> Danger, this conversation has derailed. Thank you for getting us back on track, announcer man. But I cannot imagine a movie more anticipated than that one. And it, part of it was because our generation had been children when those movies were popular. And then when this prequel was coming out, the next one, we were in that prime money-wasting demographic, <laughs> the get these guys to go see it 20 times kind of demographic. <laughs> right there in college where we were willing to camp out to get tickets to something like that rather than go to class. Dude, I took the day off from school. That It was May 19th, 1999. Sadly, I still remember that. But <laughs> in those days, that was a big deal and everybody was talking about it and everybody wanted to see it. Even the ones that thought, well, it might not be very good. It was an event. Were you one of those people that thought it might not be very good? I was afraid yeah. because even then, you know, movies like Dragonheart and... See, I wasn't one of those people. I had absolute faith at the time still in George Lucas. Well, see, I had a great love for the original trilogy, partly because of when I saw it, but partly because of just the power of those films for our generation. And, and it seems like for the next generation as well. There have been lots of, of new kids that become huge Star Wars fans due to those films. But I was afraid that it's like, what if after 16 years I go to it and I'm just too old or I don't feel that magic? And maybe I was setting myself up to not have too lofty of expectations because people were saying I had a friend that I watched the Oscars with, the 99 Oscars, and he was saying next year at this time, George Lucas is going to be up there and John Williams is going to be getting another Oscar and best art direction and best sound and best special effects and best screenplay and all that. He honestly thought that it was going to be that great. 
And now I think back on it and I just, I laugh. I think, wow, (laughs) you naive boy. Silly man. But I knew people that got tattoos of Darth Maul before the movie came out. Uh, And they're like, where's the laser removal? I haven't said on the air, but I've told you many times about a cousin of my friend's who named his son and his baby that was born in 99, Anakin, thinking, I don't know, just thinking of this beautiful blonde kid (laughs) that couldn't act. I I guess not knowing where it was going to go. Your point is? So you had set yourself up for the chance that it might not be a good film. I tried to. The hype machine was so powerful (laughs) that it was hard not to get run over. See, I hadn't learned to do that yet when that movie came out since then you know and because of that film probably and others that followed it i've learned to expect the worst now and when a film like transformers came out which again takes something from when we were children that we loved and brings it back and says hey here you go it's all that nostalgia and the great stuff that you loved except for we screwed it up really bad but pay us money for it all the same you know now i was ready for that movie to suck and so I wasn't too disappointed when it happened. You know, it's probably and, around the time that this episode hits that Transformers 2 yeah, is going to be coming true. out in the theaters. Scale from 1 to 10, how likely are you to see Transformers 2? <sighs> 2, probably. It's possible that I'll see it at some point, but I've learned my lesson with Transformers. You know, there's G.I. Joe coming out this summer as well, which I'm, again, just as trepidatious about. I'll probably see that one long before I see Transformers, just because I guess they haven't already kicked me in the nuts with G.I. Joe yet. They already did it with Transformers, and they're not going to fool me again. G.I. Joe is basically the same school of thought. If you thought thought Transformers Transformers didn't didn't have enough explosions, explosions, well, we've got something something for you. you. G.I. Joe, Joe, The Rise of of Cobra. If you you wish that the human human beings beings were computer-generated and not just the the robots, robots. (laughs) then G.I. Joe is the movie for you. Uh, You know, I absolutely loved G.I. Joe when I was a kid. I watched that cartoon every friggin' day. I owned a ton of those toys. I played G.I. Joe with my friends all the time. I even saw the friggin' movie, which was pure crap. And unfortunately, I just assume that it's going to suck. What's worse is like all the kids are going to start wearing like Snake Eyes shirts and it's going to be from the crappy movie. Like they've been wearing those crappy Optimus Prime shirts from the crappy movie instead oh, the, of the, 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 the cool nondescript ones. Megatron that looks right. like, oh geez, he looks like a junkyard with eyes or something. Right. There's no nothing cool about it. Well, hey, I'm not going to go see Transformers 2. I'm just saying it here right on the air. But I may see G.I. Joe. You know, if enough people tell me that, hey, that's worth seeing, or if you drag me out to it, maybe we can talk about that. But yeah, it's one of those where I just don't feel like there's any hope that that movie can. <laughs> well, a trailer, like I said a couple of weeks ago, is engineered to give you a glimpse of what the movie is and hopefully to show you a couple of moments to whet your appetite. And the trailer for G.I. Joe, it was like a a cross to a vampire, a kryptonite to Superman, (laughs) or a prophylactic to that octuplets chick. Oh, it just chased me off. But, you know, I had a friend that told me, you didn't like Transformers because of how much you loved that as a kid. And I honestly feel like, look, I'm willing to give people the benefit of the doubt on certain subjects, but uh, crap is crap. Yeah, I think that was part of why I disliked Transformers, because the robots were not characters. There was Autobots and Decepticons, and that was basically, the, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, you don't know them apart. At the end, they kill Jazz, and they go, oh, Jazz, it was so sad that you die, you were a good friend, or but, so, whatever. Oh, wait, anyway, which one but, was Jazz? Jazz was the yellow one? The blue he, one? I the orange? White? I don't oh, he's know. the black one. <laughs> and that, that was the thing. That was the only way you could tell the difference of the, of the robots. Is this one is yellow, and that one is red, and that one is blue, or whatever. If the camera stopped long enough for you to even <laughs> differentiate you between colors. Co- and I think they even had two yellow ones or something. It was just like completely worthless. And Jazz dies, and he's, he's like, oh, oh Jazz, Jazz, you, you weren't really an important, important character in this film, but it's sad to see you die. die. Nobody Nobody shed shed a tear for you. Because we didn't spend any time on you at all, and nobody cares. Well, okay, I had no childhood memories or any experience whatsoever with Speed Racer. Uh And yet I saw that trailer, and I was like, whoa, 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 not for me. I do not want to see that. And from the people who saw Speed Racer, uh, they told me it was way better than Transformers. I'm willing to believe them, but (laughs) I don't need to see Speed Racer. So there was was nothing to do with childhood love to make that just... But I, I think... The experience of Phantom Menace probably taught a lot of kids or a lot of young people about the unfairness of life. 
the way that our parents, our grandparents had Bambi to show that, hey, the man is bad, Bambi's mom gets killed, or they had Old Yeller. He gets put down at the end, folks. This is what life is. Uh, <laughs> just the dashed expectations of Phantom Menace. It made a lot of people unhappy. I mean, how many times did you hear people say that George Lucas raped their childhood? Or how many times did you just... I heard you say that a lot. Really? <laughs> I, I don't believe I ever said that. I, I much more despise the special editions than the prequels. But uh, that's a topic for another day. That was just a throwaway joke. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. But just it really offended a lot of people. It really hurt a lot of people. And, you know, that might be what it is. that They were hurt that they trusted in Mr. Lucas. They felt like he let them down. Or, and a lot of people said this movie was obviously made for kids. And you're not a kid. And so, you know, you were disappointed. You wanted him to make a, an R-rated bloodbath movie for you. And <laughs> there were a lot of arguments for and against, a lot more against than for when Phantom Menace came out. And I can't honestly remember what I felt. There was too much stuff going on. You and I made a pilgrimage where we got tickets a week before and we got a bunch of friends together. We went and saw it just as a big group, and there was a news crew right outside the doors of the theater where we saw it. And I sort of trudged out, trying to put things together in my mind. And I have midi chlorians, and Yoda didn't look like Yoda. And, and this reporter chick ran up to me and said, Did you just see The Phantom Menace? And I said, Yes. And she's like, What did you think? And I sort of froze, and I couldn't remember that I wanted a Red Riker BB gun anymore. <laughs> and I just said, Yeah, oh, it was good. I was like, thank you. And they went on to the next person and I walk off and I, I thought, oh, shoot, people are going to see me on the news <laughs> saying that it was good. And, no. and I don't know. If, if you don't have good. more to say than that, you're not going to make the news, man. <laughs> Unless they did one of those montages and have 10 people go, it was good. I didn't like it. It was good. I don't know. I don't know. Otherwise, you're out. But yeah, I was going to talk about just kind of what I remember from going to see it the first time. I remember okay. you got in there, you sit down, they showed some trailers and that. and you were The getting Titan all, AE was one of the trailers. You were getting all, the, and you're getting the beach all excited. The beach with Leonardo and DiCaprio yeah, was I do a trailer. remember the beach. And I was getting all excited, you know, almost like shaking at how cool this is going to be. And then the Lucasfilm logo comes up and everybody starts go whoa! Yeah, woo! And, and I, of course, joined in. Everybody's getting all excited. And then you see that whole Star Wars intro. Dude, I was ready to pee my pants. I was so excited about this film. And then as it went on, you know, there were some interesting new things that they were doing. And at the time, CG was still really new. So whenever they did something cool, CG, oh, yeah, oh, neat. Well, we had never seen anything on that scale before. Had right. I? That was just really new. Just the, the that amount of CG, the level of sophistication, the armies of, of thousands uh -huh. of, of droids and, and things like that that we had only ever seen with Braveheart, Lawrence of Arabia type things with hundreds of extras. Uh, another thing that I remember being a big deal is, you know, that they had really great sound design on that film. The ship's coming in, the Jedi ship, and it goes past the screen and you hear the spaceship sounding engine but you also hear something that sounds like a propeller plane or something inside of that sound and they did that again and again on that film where they had some really oh, the, dense the sound design pod race yeah Do you the remember the all that kind of stuff going along just really interesting stuff like that and of course the crowning moment of that film is when they get to that big lightsaber battle <laughs> And yeah, the choir comes in, and you, this and this is probably completely unprecedented by any other film. There was a friggin' video of that song, and they would show this on MTV of a classical music. This song was made with entirely orchestral instruments. There was singing, but it was a choir, and that was it. You don't see that kind of crap on MTV. TRL, they're like, hey! I'm on John Williams Star Wars. <laughs> they don't do that, but that happened. And so everybody already knew that song before they even went to see the film. And then that song comes up and sends the tingles up and down your body when you hear that. And there's Darth Maul, who is also already known. Dude, just the, the level of coolness of Darth Maul. And there were three different trailers. And one of those trailers, I don't know if it was the first one or the second one, showed that double-bladed lightsaber. Uh -huh. And people were just going nuts during the trailer yeah, before whatever that. you were seeing. That was a good idea, man. Throwing out the double-bladed lightsaber, that's really a success as far as that film goes. One of the better things that happened in there. But yeah, that lightsaber fight, probably 
the best fight scene in any Star Wars film, going even back through the original ones. I don't know. Would you disagree? Do you think? Well, I Return of the Jedi or I love the original trilogy lightsaber fights because of the emotion, because of uh-huh. how much I care about the characters. The Empire Strikes Back fight is, in my opinion, the greatest fight in film history. But yeah, the choreography and the way that they set up and the intensity of that fight was just that alone was worth seeing the yeah. movie for. I remember going back and seeing it a second time. And I was like you, you know, after I came out of the film the first time, I was just like, I had a good time. I think that was a good movie. I just hadn't had time to process it all, I guess. I mean, there's so much expectation and how much was it dashed? Was it dashed? Was I happy? No, I didn't know. So I, I, yeah, I went back. I saw, I think I saw it three times in the theater, which was, you know, I didn't have money then. I didn't have money to go see a movie three times, but I did. Each time I was just like, okay, it's coming up. It's coming up. Bum, 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 bum. And again, the chill goes up and down your body and you're just like, this is going to be good. I remember this was really good. And I remember back when the movie first came out and they were like, in the original trilogy, you got to see the last vestiges of Jedis. You saw old Jedis fighting each other. And, you know, this new kid who was not especially well trained yet fight against each other but now we get to see jedis in their prime this is when jedis ruled the universe you know i guess that was what they were going for with that lightsaber fight and i'd have to say they really they really succeeded with that fight and there were some other things that they did too at the start where they added in you know powers or whatever that the force is giving these jedis that we've never seen before well, the strangest one was when they sped up. Yeah, they ran like, I real fast. I don't remember them ever doing that again in the other ones. Yeah. In fact, there, uh, that was something at the end where Obi-Wan is stuck and he can't help Qui-Gon. It's like, well, hey, you guys can do super speed or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he should have been able Why to run through real yeah. fast and get through all those things before they closed down on him. And, of course, these are things that occur to you months yeah, and months well. later or to have somebody point out. And, yeah, I, I have almost completely disowned those movies, disavowed the acknowledge of those prequels. But that lightsaber fight with Darth Maul, I would watch that right now. If you said, hey, let's pause this and go watch it, I would. <laughs> I remember being very satisfied, much more so than the ones that came later. I, I don't know what it is. Is it because that one is better choreographed, more interesting? Is it the music or is it – because we actually care about Qui-Gon. Um, that might be a little of it. I, it's hard to talk about Phantom Menace and not talk about the other two, uh, in my mind, because they're all linked together, the prequels. I don't know if we, this is the perfect time to talk about this, but Liam Neeson really came out well. I don't recall a single bad delivery of, of a line of dialogue. Oh, it's Liam Neeson. I don't re- well, yeah, Something but yet else? we have like Natalie Portman, who is a very talented actress, and she had a hard time with some of this really awful dialogue. <laughs> there is a certain kind of actor who can deliver this George stuff Lucas off. stuff. Uh, like when Harrison Ford says it's going to take a few moments to get the coordinates from the Nava computer or whatever he says, he says sells that line completely and it, it doesn't sound like the nonsense that it is or the <laughs> the extra wordy nonsense you know without precise calculations we could pass too close to a star pass right through a supernova and uh, just six or seven unnecessary words mm-hmm. in there and, and you know granted he's maybe able to cowboy up some of that dialogue <laughs> in a way that princess leia couldn't or amidala couldn't you remember how much we would mock the way she would say, my people are dying, Senator. You must do something quickly. But yeah, there was a lot of bad acting in that film. Way more than anything that happened in any of the first three films, but maybe even more than in the other two prequels. There was a few badly acted things in part two, and I don't remember part three being poorly acted. It was just mostly poorly written. But gosh... There was so many times in part one where there was just lines. And you're like, what the hell? Got those goofy aliens that are like, they went into the ventilation shaft. Oh, best and part of the whole movie. What is going on down there? What did you say? And, and the one that came out of it the worst was Jake Lloyd. Yeah. A, his dialogue seemed to have been the worst or B, he was the least talented of, yeah. of the bunch. I think back at the time, your suggestion to me was that maybe he couldn't sell the lines. And so they would just say, well, why don't you just say this? 
you know, and they try and rephrase it in a way that he could pull off or something. But God, sometimes he like goes up there to blow up the droid control ship thing at the end. And he's just like, oh, let's go left. That's a neat trick. It was just the crap that he said was so stupid. And he was supposed to be the chosen one. We're supposed to think that he's somebody special. And instead he just goes up there and acts like a doofus and accidentally blows up the ship. And hey, good job, Jake. Let's make you a Jedi. He was the focal point for a lot of people's ire in Phantom Menace. And Jar Jar. Oh, I totally... I, it's crazy. I forgot about Jar Jar. Even when I was talking about the the CG a minute ago of how advanced that was. How much it was made for kids. That kid, Jake Lloyd, he has acted since. But Not I would lot. imagine that, yeah, his agent you know, took him off the speed dial or the parents decided to enroll him in woodshop classes and stuff like that so that he would have something to fall back on because now missing a few fingers he was totally hated Uh, well i I didn't hate him immediately it took some convincing and yeah that's the weird thing with me is i didn't hate phantom menace at first Mm -hmm. it took a lot of people saying well have you ever noticed this and i thought well i haven't and then the next time i saw it i did notice that part and i winced or just conversation with somebody where I'm like, you know, just like the way he reacts, the boy reacts when she says, you're a funny little boy. I'm a person and my name's Anakin. Yeah. It's something like that where, okay, the third or fourth time that I heard that, it starts to bother me and it builds up and builds up. And I've seen Phantom Menace more than I've seen the other two. But there were just so many moments that, ugh, icky, icky goo. Did he crash it? Whoopy whoopy. But I... Are you an angel? Oh, Kitster, the little friend. It's like every word that came out of that kid's mouth. The dance that Wald, the little Greedo baby, does. The dance of triumph. Oh my gosh, that's seared on the back of my retinas, and I wish it would go. It's so, so horrible. And everybody around my age had a list of things that they didn't like about the movie, and we would compare them, and it was almost fun. You compare them and then, oh, yeah, I need to add you that to build my list. To it. Yeah, and, and so it's it's interesting. It took me a little while to actively dislike Phantom Menace. But at first, yeah, we were just bowled over. There was just too much in it, too many characters, too many new aliens. An 11-minute long pod race scene that, <laughs> that could have been the focal point of a normal action film. That lightsaber battle, the cutting Darth Maul in half, just the le- the level of realism when they burn Qui-Gon at the end was one of those things where I had never seen anything like that. Yeah, just the countless stuff. But okay, I think when I think about Phantom Menace and what I didn't like, that really detestable Yoda puppet <laughs> is... And is how the- much of a douche Yoda turned out to be. <laughs> That's funny because, see, I had a friend that told me that and he's like, the Jedi Council were just a bunch of dicks. And the hackles rose up on the back of my neck because I was like, oh, you just insulted Master Yoda. How dare you? But the more I thought about it, I was just like, well, they really were. They did want us to side with Qui-Gon and in so doing, the guys did seem kind of douchey. One your guy. thoughts dwell on <laughs> your mother. Except for that one guy with the really, really long neck. The really skinny long neck. I liked that guy. I at <laughs> one point even knew that guy's name. Did you? Uh, see, I never knew his name, but I, I remember coming out of that and talking with people and going, how would that guy do in a lightsaber fight? I think he would lose his head pretty fast. It probably happened, because I don't <laughs> think he shows up in the next two. He, maybe he was one of the guys in that arena battle or whatever. No, he just was You're in going a to pay speeder. for all the Jedis you killed today. Who said that? It was uh, oh, Anakin. Anakin, yeah. I don't know. It it may be the the dialogue that nobody could pull that off. <laughs> you and McGregor didn't fare too badly mm-hmm. with those. Although, yeah, he was given a couple of lines that are just awful. Depends on what, Dex. I wish George Lucas had let somebody help him with those movies. He needed Lawrence Kasdan or somebody like that to help him out with the scripts, man. He just could have really helped to have a, a team behind him. Do you want to talk about Jar Jar? That's the last thing Misa wanted. Can. How much did you dislike and how much do you dislike Jar Jar? I never liked him. You know, even after the first showing, I was like, you know, that was pretty good. But Jar Jar was really kind of annoying. He was irritating the whole way through. And the stupid crap that he did and all the fart jokes and, oh, B. Yusa. And his stupid pigeon that he talked, everything about him was just really irritating from the beginning all the way through. And I was really happy 
when they at least learn the lesson of let's cut Jar Jar out as much as possible in the rest of the films. Yeah, no, I despised him from the beginning to the end. I could not stand Jar Jar. There were a lot of people saying that Jar Jar represented certain members of the population. And what was strange is they couldn't agree on who he represented, but there were minority groups outraged regardless. And I wonder if there are still people that are angry about that. It's <laughs> funny. It, it, since the movie has become roundly despised by all, they probably don't really need to be offended anymore. When was the last time you saw Phantom Menace? Probably not since about the time that what is it, Revenge of the Sith came out. There was that big, I don't even know how big it was. Because I was a Star Wars fan, I paid a lot of attention to the Phantom edit. You know, where the fans okay. had made their own version of the film where they cut out things that they didn't like. And some people managed to add in a little bit that wasn't there before. But, yeah, you know, I don't think I've watched the actual movie since I saw that Phantom edit. I don't even remember watching episode one and two, like the week that episode three came out, you know, in preparation for it. I, I just didn't. Part of it is that we were adults by that yeah. point. We didn't have the time to watch things again and again and again. And left to my own devices as a kid, I would have watched Star Wars every single day of the week. <laughs> and I'll bet there were some months in 83 when I watched it 15 times. Uh, yeah, I think the last time that I saw Phantom Menace was when I showed it to my kid. He's a big fan of Star Wars. I've tried to get him to watch, you know, the, the Star Wars movies from, from the beginning. He had a lot of Star Wars guys from, I think it was part two. We found them at KB Toys. They were like liquidating them and they just kept coming. And so we'd buy them. They were like a buck fifty or two bucks or something like that. So we'd go and we'd hang out at the mall for a while because I had to watch the kids. And while my wife was at work, so we'd go to the mall and we'd go by the KB and we'd see which guys they have that we haven't got yet. And we collected a bunch of, you know... That's the way with collecting Star Wars figures. You get the stupid ones that you could care less about. We had like the third senator from the right of the group that comes in with Amidala when they go to talk to Palpatine or whatever. Why? Who wants that figure? Who would care in the least? I don't know, but we had it. So it's been 10 years. 10 years does not seem like a long time. Phantom Menace still seems like a new movie. Lots of times people will talk about a movie that came out in 95 and I'll think... Well, yeah, that's still pretty new. I talked about that with you once, I think. I don't know if we did it on the air, but just how weird it is that a movie like Tommy Boy, it's like 15 years old. Dude, I'm old, I guess, but it doesn't seem like a long time ago that those movies came out. But I guess to somebody who's 20 years old, a movie that's 10 years old was ancient history. When we were kids, our generation thought that a movie in black and white was old. But to this generation, it's probably a movie where people don't have cell phones is old. <laughs> don't worry. The Force will guide us. Most of my hatred for Phantom Menace in the past 10 years has sort of gone away. I'm ambivalent about it. I don't get angry so much yeah. with most of that stuff. I, I can get angry if, if we're in the middle of a conversation and we're talking about the prequels not matching with the original trilogy or uh -huh. you know kids that think Hayden Christensen plays Darth Vader. For the most part, my anger is just kind of ebbed. I've, I've mellowed out, man. Yeah. It happens after 10 years, man. He's like, yeah, I used to spit on people walking out of Phantom Menace, saying that they were killing babies, but now I <laughs> have turned into a yuppie. You know, it, it that just happens. You, you hated it when it was in the moment, but time has gone on. It's turned out to be probably the best of the three, so... I, I agree completely. It's weird. Phantom Menace was the one... Uh, you remember when Episode 2 was coming out and everybody who disliked Phantom Menace were saying, well, this is the one where he's going to get it right. This one's yeah. going to be better. They learned uh, their lesson, and now they're not going to screw it up anymore. And the lesson they learned was cut Jar Jar out, but... It went wrong in ways that Phantom Menace never even dreamed of. And then... Episode 3, the one that everybody loves the most, is the one I like the least, that I've watched the fewest times. It just The train had already gone off the tracks, and by the time Revenge of the Sith came out, all that was left was like the trolley car, and it was, it was done. I think Phantom Menace is the most satisfying of the three films. It was the most crowd-pleasing. I don't know, it had the most breakthroughs, I, I, I think. You know, I used to think these new trilogy films that came out you know they sullied the memory of the original films that i used to love so much and 
now that they've come out, they're locked together. And so you have the good part and then you have the crappy part and you can't have them separate. But as time has gone by, I don't think that's true. They're separate and they really are. And I see them that way in my mind. And I think a lot of people do. So it's not that way anymore. They don't sully one another. And so I guess I can accept it. It sounds like a good place to go out on. Okay. We See you later, folks. It was purely an accident that we started to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. And they say time heals all wounds. Not that Phantom Menace left a giant wound. It's just you realize with the passage of years that it ultimately doesn't impact the world all that much, mm-hmm. these, these prequels. And, yeah, what you said totally stands. I love the original trilogy, and I don't love the prequels. And I don't see any hypocrisy in that. It's just, they're different. It's harder to uh, to hate it like I used to. Yeah, well, there's there's new stuff to hate. I don't know. Is there anything that's come out this, this summer so far that you think sucked? You wish you hadn't wasted your time with it yet? I haven't gone to them. I, like, I imagine that Night of the Museum 2 sucked. That movie didn't look good to me. Why spend the $8 or the two hours? That's because you hate Ben Stiller and, and Owen Wilson especially. And, you know, so casting of Owen Wilson ensures that you won't go to see it. Have you seen any Owen Wilson film besides Cars within the last, like, five years? I don't think so. There are certain actors who do the same performance again and again or do a certain kind of movie. For example, most of Adam Sandler's films are similar. Most of Will Ferrell's films are similar. Most of Jim Carrey's films in the 90s were similar. But if you hate Happy Gilmore and you hate Billy Madison, then don't go see Little Nicky, all right? (laughs) Just don't go see Little Nicky. (laughs) You don't need to bring up that other stuff. Well, that was our show today. I hope you enjoyed it. You probably didn't, but that's all right. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. There are three flowers in a vase. The second flower is blue. Good night, folks. If you enjoyed today's episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, please drop by iTunes and give us a five-star rating. We'd be eternally grateful you did. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. Do people use the word tree hugger anymore? I think so. Or has it been replaced by tree fugger?